Uh, so welcome everyone to our uh, next uh, AATRN interview. So today we're going to have Radmila Sazdanovic interview Robert Greist. Um, as you well know, AATRN has been very active during this pandemic and we continue uh, being so with uh, seminars and with interviews. Um, and uh, this recording will also appear on YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. And uh, so now, uh, uh, as said, everyone should uh, send private messages to Elkanan, who will then um, ask questions uh, to, um, at the end uh, of the interview. Uh, so now I will just say a couple, a couple of words to introduce Redmila, and then she's going to take over and uh, introduce uh, Robert. Um, so Redmila received her PhD at George Washington University in 2010 uh, under the supervision of Josef Pschititsky. I think I got it right. Uh, and then she did two postdocs, one at UPenn uh, with um, Professor Greist, uh, um, which is sort of one of the reasons why she's interviewing him today, and the other one at MSRI at Berkeley. Uh, and now she uh, has um, she has been a uh, she is an associate professor uh, at North Carolina State, where she was also an, uh, an assistant professor before that. Uh, and she is well known for her work on knot theory, applied topology, categorification, and math art. And uh, you're going to be happy to learn that she has permanent exhibitions on her work at the IMA in Minneapolis, and then, for example, uh, at George Univer uh, Washington University, etc. And uh, thank you, Radmila, for hosting the interview today. Thank you, Sarah, for, for a wonderful introduction, and um, big, big thanks to you, Alkanan, and Henry, for organizing all of the events in the in this network and and. Um, uh, keeping us all together, but also for giving me the opportunity um, to interview Rob. So just briefly, Rob Grice is uh, Andrea Mitchell, a uh, university professor, um, uh, and, uh, and also with a joint appointment uh, in both mathematics and um, electrical, electrical systems engineering departments. Uh, he's also a co-director of Penn First Plus program that supports uh, first-generation low-income students. And um, it's um, not a surprise that he's here. He's an award-winning researcher and teacher. His research has been recognized um, with the NSF Career, PK's SIAM 50 awards, and supported by a number of large grants. Um, he's um, teaching. Um, uh, awards sort of include the Mathematical Association of America's James Crawford Prize that um, recognizes um, respected teachers and inspiring speakers. Um, Rob is dedicated to making uh, math um, approachable and uh, accessible. And he's the author of um, several books and courses and also um, maybe along the way, maybe independently, a designer and animator. Uh, but I would like to let uh, Rob tell us about his math universe. So welcome, Rob. Hello, and thank you, Radmila. Thank you to the organizers and to the audience. Okay, so let's start in the spirit of Dante's Inferno in media stress. So um, most people know you as a leader in applied algebraic topology, focusing on application to sensor networks, uh, robotics, signal processing, but you have many math personas, including that of dynamicist. And um, so where do you see yourself? How do you see yourself in, the, in this world? Yeah, so I often get the question, uh, what exactly are you? And I've I've had that pretty much my entire professional life as, uh, as have some other people, some of whom I see in this audience. My story is, is pretty weird. I went to college to study mechanical engineering. I studied mechanical engineering because my favorite courses in high school were drafting, mechanical drawing with a, with a T-square, the old school stuff, and geometry. Those were the, the two things that I loved the most. People said, oh, you're good at math and science. You should go into engineering. I went into mechanical engineering, again, thinking I was going to be a draftsman. I think I was among the last group of people at this university to learn drafting uh, the, the old way without computers. I had this fantastic calculus teacher, a, a really great geometer by the name of Henry Wente. 
and I I saw that he had done some kind of research with, I don't know, weird four dimensional stuff. We all thought he was a weird guy, but over time, I just really fell in love with the mathematics that I learned. I just wanted to learn more and more mathematics to understand the things that I was learning in my engineering courses. So I thought about uh, quitting engineering to go into math. I thought about quitting engineering to go into literature or philosophy or other things, but I, I stuck with it, got an engineering degree, and then went to grad school for applied mathematics, where I took algebraic topology courses at the wazoo because I was at Cornell and you had Alan Hatcher there and Karen Voigtman and all these just fantastic people to learn from. I took so many topology courses that uh, all the math PhD students were like, what are you? You're, you're in applied math. You're not supposed to be here in these classes. Why are you doing this? And I always had this sense that algebraic topology is going to be really, really useful. I just, I just didn't know exactly for what at the time. I remember thinking to myself, this stuff is so beautiful. It has to be useful. I wound up doing a PhD that was focused on applications of topology to dynamical systems, uh, knot theory in particular. You and I have that background in knot theory in common. And I, I spent, I don't know, some time of doing as much as I could in applications of knot theory to dynamics, to bifurcation theory, things like that. And then I just got bored. I started moving on to other applications of different types of topology. It was at this time that I met John Ettenayer, fantastic guy who taught me about uh, contact structures and contact topology. And I taught him about dynamical systems. We had a bit of a deal going on. And then we wound up spending a bunch of time trying to figure out how to apply contact topology to fluid dynamics and, and did that for a while and then got bored and then started doing applications of topology to robotics, then to sensor networks and to data analysis, a whole bunch of other stuff. I, I kind of get bored quickly with just about everything ex except topology because it's, it's the one constant that is been throughout all the research that I've done. So I, I guess if I had to say what I am, I would say I'm a, an applied mathematician, trying to be a contemporary applied mathematician, as opposed to a, a classical applied mathematician. That's long answer to a short question. It's, it's wonderful. And, and as you pointed out, you have learned a lot of math. And I see that you're um, always on a hunt for more. <laughs> so you have also contributed to lots of area, different areas of mathematics, as you point out. I mean, before I knew you as an applied topologist, I did know your work on, on, on branch surfaces supporting all links. So um, maybe you can tell us how do these different fields compare? Um, both in the ways that math is done, communicated, how they interact, how they contribute. So I'm, I don't, I don't quite know how to answer that. I, I will say that over time, I've noticed quite a difference in the, the culture and the community of different research areas. Some are much more uh, open and inviting others a bit more uh, uh, adversarial, mercenary. Um, I, I guess I don't want to badmouth any, any group of, of people, but you know, there's, there's kind of a reason I don't go to robotics conferences much anymore. And I really much more enjoy going to applied topology or topological data analysis. Uh, workshops, conferences, things like that. It it's got a really great community. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pat all the organizers on the back here and say that y'all are doing a great job building a community that's really welcoming to lots of different types of people with lots of different backgrounds. Not all mathematics research communities, not all applied uh, science communities are are like that. So when you get a good community with good welcoming culture, 
you have to nurture that, take care of that. So, so uh, that, that's 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 interesting, and you need to talk a little bit about um, how your um, about your education path that that was also um, sort of quite unusual. So, and 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 I guess I, I do need to thank you for encouraging and empowering me to venture in a new area of math while supporting my my existing research interest. Um, so, but maybe for um, for maybe more junior people in the audience, um, it's important to. It, it's it's rather important what you learn and and when. So in the absence of of finding great people like John Adnire and making good deals, uh, maybe you can tell us um, what guided your decisions uh, when you were sort of establishing your mathematical professional identity. Sort of how how are you making choices, which we eventually all have to make. Yeah, what to say there? I. I will say that pretty much every decision I made along the way in terms of how to how to optimize my career, what to, what to study next, where to publish, um, it was mostly a dumb luck. Uh, some of it good luck, some of it not so good luck. I the people who advised me along the way were really uh, wonderful and caring, but we're pretty hands off. And I was also um, sort of clueless enough ab about the fact that you you really have to to be careful with how you uh, how you plan and progress through a, a career. I, I was very much, oh gosh, this sounds awful. When I was young, ay, ay, ay. When I was young, I was very much in the spirit of I'm I'm just going to study whatever sounds cool and have fun with it for as long as I can. The job market's never been good in this area. Thought about leaving academia several times, but uh, got lucky. And only in retrospect can I look back and say, "Oh my God, that was stupid. This was dumb. I should never done that. Why didn't somebody tell me not to do this?" I've tried to. Uh, I don't know, pay it forward a little bit by helping people who I advise with specifically those aspects of how do you, how do, you do well in a job interview? How do you um, get better at communicating your results? All these things that are really important to building a career that I don't think we teach as well as we teach the mathematics that is, of course, the prerequisite for all that. I see. Maybe I'll get I'll get back to that because there's there's teaching of and learning of mathematics and then and then teaching how to navigate the professional waters. But but maybe just while we're on the topic of like different areas of mathematics and and sort of making decisions, you said that you get bored of different um, things easily or quickly, uh, maybe not easily. Um, but so maybe you, you know, while you were threading the different waters, mathematical waters, um, do you have one or more or many um, of the favorite math results? Yeah, okay. So, hmm. Let's see, first of all, let me, uh, let, let me just say a bit of advice with regards to doing different, uh, types of mathematics, learning different types of mathematics. There have been several, several times in my career where someone is telling me about what they're doing. Someone's telling me about some type of mathematics they're excited about. And I say, usually to myself, yeah, I'm not gonna need that. That can't possibly be useful for anything that I would ever care about. So that's nice, but yeah. Mm -mm. Nope, not going to take the time to learn that. And then, wouldn't you know it, years later, it comes back to bite me. Oh, if only I had known this, then I would have been able to do, oh, all this. Or, hey, this thing that I discounted previously is the only tool that I can think of that's going to work at solving this problem that I have to solve. This has happened to me with so many different things. I can remember the first time someone told me about cat zero geometry. 
thinking, wow, why does anybody study that? I mean, come on, what, is, what could that possibly be useful for? I get it if you think that it's cool, but no, nah, I'm not going to bother learning anything about that. And then, yes, I wound up having to repent, go back, learn it all from the beginning, the slow, painful route, because I really needed it to solve certain problems in robotics. And I think that's happened with lots of different areas of mathematics as well. In your question, you asked if I had a, a favorite uh, type of mathematics or a favorite bit of mathematics, favorite theorem, what was it? Yeah, so some something along the lines. I mean, I'm basically um, trying to tease out from you whether someone who knows so much mathematics but sort of has an eye towards um, um, both theoretical results and applied results. Uh, you know, what's favorite or, or maybe even a more general question um, I mean, maybe this is not a great time to introduce that, but we all um, have like some sort of notions of what good math is or what a beautiful math is or what a useful mathematics is. And then we all have preferences for, well, maybe all, I should speak for myself, right? There's definitely like appreciation of certain mathematics results that I have that um, that are in the areas of mathematics that I'll never do <laughs> for one reason or another. But I sort of do realize that they're beautiful, um, maybe independently of whether they're useful or applicable or generalizable. There's, um, there's things that I wanted to learn, but um, nev never did. But sort of I, I know that they're there and they're very good. There are things that I had to learn for a particular thing. And then there's things that I've learned just because I was fascinated by them. So um, take it away. <laughs> okay, so so the 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 bit of mathematics that that lies in the intersection of the Venn diagram between really beautiful, really useful, almost a unifying principle within lots of different areas of mathematics. Yeah, I that, that that's not hard for me to answer. For me, it's got to be Euler characteristic. That is that is such a such a pretty idea. There, it's one of these things that there are so many ways to think about it, to understand it. You never get tired of learning something new about Euler characteristic. In the same way that you you really can't exhaust all there is to learn about derivatives in all their different emanations. The Euler characteristics, same thing. It's so beautiful. It's so useful in so many different ways. It's been such an important part of the research that I've done over the years with Yuli Brishnikov, with others. The way that it crops up in unexpected places like the rank nullity theorem from linear algebra that's that's really a statement about the Euler characteristic of exact sequences. The, the way that you connect it to homology through that simple lemma, the way that that then can be interpreted as Euler characteristic being a decategorification of homology, something that you know a lot about and has been prominent in your work, Everything from that to the more geometric aspects where you you see it playing a central role in the gauss binet theorem, in all kinds of important stuff, Riemann rock, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Euler characteristic. If, if I'm on a desert island and I can only take one mathematical thing with me, that's that's what I'm taking, Euler characteristic. I see. Well, that, that's that's beautiful. Uh, I mean, beautiful explanation and a beautiful view of something that's like very a, a very simple um, and and at first look very simple mathematical object. Um, but but you bring out um, you, you emphasize the the importance of sort of not neglecting something that looks simple because it's a it's related and it's a it's a in some ways a shadow or decategorification or so you name it. It's 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 um. It's kind of omnipresent and, and related to many deep area, um, ideas in, in, in many different areas. And that's, that's, that's maybe one thing that um, 
that um, I was curious about, because again, you know a lot of mathematics, but you've also contributed in, in very also technically challenging kind of aspects of, of certain areas of mathematics. And then there was always a question for me uh, when I was trying to, uh, to, to figure out wh where, where am I and who am I in math? There's sort of different aspects of, of being, let's say, very technically strong or very, very good in a particular area of mathematics. And then, um, and then I think that's easier to comprehend to most people, right? You, you, you have a thing, you, you learn it really well. Um, but then I think something that um, became even more apparent for me when I, when I joined your work is, is um, how important it is to sort of see mathematics as a whole, but also mathematics in the context of other sciences. Um, and, and sort of um, look for ideas and, and applications and, and also the applications, if that's a word, <laughs> that's not the thing. But, um, but I mean, again, you are, um, I apologize if I, if I misquote you, but um, you did say that the topology is the most useful unused mathematics. And you did say so a um, certain number of years ago, that's more than five. <laughs> Uh, let's put it that way. So, um, and, and maybe even much more. Um, so, why? How did you see it? Why did you see um, see that things that way like that long ago when you know that was not so apparent as it is now? Okay. So, uh, again, in my in my background in my training, I had a pretty broad exposure to applied mathematics especially from the, the engineering side of things. And it's, it's very much the case that you, you pick a typical applied mathematician and they have, a, they have a pretty standard toolbox, pretty big, powerful toolbox, but they have, a, they have a toolbox that they use for solving problems. And many, but not all areas of core mathematics are represented in that toolbox, or at least that was the case when I was starting out, where the idea of using topology in applied mathematics context was very niche, very um, sort of not a mainstream idea at all. So I have, I have certainly spent a lot of time arguing or evangelizing for the use of topology in applied mathematics. And you are correct. I, there was a time where I was, I was saying very liberally that topology is the most useful, least used math. I'm not sure that that is now the case anymore. There's been so much successful work by people in the topological data analysis community. And, and more, more broadly, there's other groups using ideas from topology now. It's, it's much more uh, out there and accepted, for which I am very grateful. You might, you might be asking the follow-up question, which I'll anticipate. Uh, would I update that statement now? What, what is today the, the most useful, least used mathematics? I don't feel as qualified to, um, to make pronouncements on that so much. I will say that I do like to, hmm, I, I think there's a place in the mathematics world for, uh, how should we say it? venture capitalists, not actual venture capitalists providing millions and millions of dollars. So well, that would be cool. But, but people who are playing that role, who see a potentially really, really useful area of mathematics that is currently not receiving enough support, enough attention and directing attention to it. If I had to, if I had to become a math venture capitalist, if, if I had millions of dollars in grant money to hand out to people, what areas would I be sending that to? Not allowed to, to, to be my own work, of course, 
I would, I think the first thing that I would start investing in would be some combination of homotopy type theory and automated theorem proving. All of the, the revolutionary work that's happening in there, that is absolutely going to change a lot of things in mathematics. I, I believe that very strongly. This is not an area that I work in, but I have enough of an amateur interest to see within that the, the sparks of something much bigger than it currently is. I would say that if there's a, a simple set of, of, of mm, not simple, but if there's a, a, a tool that a mathematician could just pick up and, and instantly know that would be useful, what would that be? Um, uh, machine learning, probably all the cool stuff that's happening there. That's not yet mathematics. If I had to pick something that was a, math a mathematical tool that is more useful than people think it is, I would, I would say homological algebra. I, I really think that homological algebra is underappreciated to the point where I think we ought to be teaching basic homological algebra over fields to undergraduates in linear algebra classes. I think this should be part of the standard linear algebra class, a serious linear algebra class, but still. Okay, well, well, thank you for bringing up so many topics and, 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 and here's the advice of, of something that, that everyone should know <laughs> if they don't, um, if they're kind of interested in new things, but, um, but you also, bring up there's there's always there was always at least to my understanding a question of, of which areas of mathematics would be useful or maybe um deciding and again this is just my point of view deciding against their usefulness potential usefulness in applications because they did not seem computable um so i think one thing that's apparent for me in your work that there's a lot to be um said and done will recognizing which um algebraic or otherwise structures that sort of exist in theoretical mathematics sort of model uh, or provide good frameworks for um, applications in various fields. Um, I, I don't know whether you agree with that, but you know, maybe um, I, can, I can follow up with, um, with um, your work on, in, with sheaves, right? Because yes, you know, if you looked at sheaves, you sort of know that they provide a connection between topological and geometric properties of spaces, let's say by looking at sheaf cohomology. But then again, you were the one to kind of uh, recognize um, their potential for applications long time ago, right? Um, but that's clearly not because they were like the most computable thing, right? Um, yeah, so sheaves, are very near and dear to my heart. This is this is something that I've been thinking about for uh, I don't know about fifteen years now. the The first time that I thought to myself, "Wow, this this stuff with sheaves might actually really be useful," was as with so many things in my career. Uh, the inspiration came after talking to Yuli Baryshnikov, who is just an amazing mathematician who knows. I think you could pick pretty much any area of mathematics and talk to Yuli and say, hey, Yuli, what would this be good for? And he just wouldn't skip a beat. He, oh, oh, I'm glad you asked. You know, I was thinking the other day, da, 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 da. This, uh, this is one of the great people to talk to. I remember talking with him one day about a problem it involved some robotics thing, tracking things around. And as Yuli does, he just said, oh, well, you know, you could think of this in terms of a sheaf with this, this, this. And of course I didn't understand what he meant. It took me a little while to uh, learn a few things to decode what he was saying, but I really got the bug after that and started looking for places where Oh, hey, you know what? A little bit of sheaf theory might be useful there. As you intimated in your question at first, it was really difficult to get anything that was useful because um, it's so hard to compute anything. The real breakthrough there came 
in the PhD thesis that Justin Curry wrote under me, where he sort of rediscovered and revived the theory of cellular sheaves, where you look at these algebraic data structures in a, a much more simple category where everything is stratified according to some underlying cell structure. It's comparable to the difference between uh, singular homology, which is great for proving theorems, but really impossible to compute, and then cellular homology, which is great for computations, but it's very difficult to prove theorems about it. That same dichotomy exists in sheaves. And when you have an equivalence between the, the powerful and the computable, that's, that's where it's really helpful. And so a lot of my work over the past 15 years has been finding interesting applications of these sheaves, especially in the cellular context. I see. So, so I guess that's where kind of knowing a lot of different types of mathematics and whatever is helpful, um, or at least within different points of view on the same object is very helpful in, in, in trying to get things to work the way you need them to work or want them to work or, or whatever it is. But um, uh, interesting that you bring up the, so definitely Justin was one of the people who, who sort of um, did work under you, but there's also, um, um, your recent work with um, Jacob Hansen, where you kind of take the um, sheaf applications of sheaf theory to to sort of like a different in a slightly different direction, I would say. And um, um, I'm I'm thinking about your paper on opinion dynamics on discourse sheaves, um, where it seems to, I mean, you develop framework for analyzing social networks and and more than just analyzing. So. Um, Maybe you can, it's very interesting to me. So maybe could you tell us more about this work and um, maybe potential um, of sheaves or something else for applications in new areas of science? Yeah, so let me give a, a somewhat um, circuitous or, or roundabout answer to that question. A sheaf I think of as a, a data structure. It's a data structure over space. I mean, typically, you've got some sort of algebraic data that is whatever uh, category your, your stocks uh, live in. The hmm, thinking of sheaves just in terms of their more category theoretic uh, definition, instantiation, that's not really all that useful in and of itself. It's really just a language. And I, I don't know, some people uh, like doing uh, math with uh, certain tools as just language. I really, I really need something that's going to do something, that's going to compute something. For sheaves, I think the really, really useful ingredients are cohomology which instead of computing qualitative features or holes of the underlying space, they compute the, the holes, the, the features in the data structure that sits above the space. That's a, that's a big idea. It's very, very useful. Cohomology classes as obstructions tell you when problems can or cannot be solved. They classify the types of solutions if a problem is solvable. All that, really great. Cohomology is, is the, the killer app for sheaves, but there's another, there's another tool as well that takes me to the answer to your question. And that is Laplacians and their role in Hodge theory from just classical multivariable calculus, all that div grad curl stuff. You can set it up with differential forms, you set up a Laplacian, the kernel of the Laplacian tells you about the underlying manifold. In the same way, if you set up Laplacians for sheaves over space, then the harmonic cochains, the kernel of the Laplacian, computes the sheaf cohomology. This is such a deep idea. This is something that came out in work with Jacob Hansen when he was writing his thesis. 
And since then, uh, we and other people in my group have been able to use Laplacians on sheaves to, to give applications in, in signal processing, in distributed optimization, distributed consensus, and more recently, in terms of opinion dynamics over networks, where a sheaf is really a convenient heterogeneous structure for modeling opinions over a social network. Everybody has their own opinions about lots of different topics. The things that I care about might not be the things that you care about, might not be related at all to the things we're talking about when we're doing politics or trying to build a coalition or a consensus. A lot of the uh, heterogeneity involved in these more uh, social science settings. I think that that's really a very good fit for what sheaves can do, where your stocks can vary dramatically from place to place. But if you can get a good sheaf structure, if you can get a Laplacian on that, then you can talk about things like running diffusion methods, running heat equations in order to come to consensus, or setting up other types of dynamics like reaction diffusion type systems where you have outcomes that are more interesting and realistic than everybody agreeing tacitly or otherwise. So I think there's a lot, lot yet to be done with applications of sheaves over social networks to lots of different systems, not merely opinion dynamics, but maybe economic systems, lots of cool stuff. If you're interested in, in things like that, my recommendation is to learn a little bit about Laplacians on Sheaves, because that is, that is very much a killer app kind of tool. So again, thank you for advice on what to learn, but, but also something that's like, to me, um, apparent in, in, in what you've just said, um, but possibly true in general is that the advanced with mathematics sort of definitely depends on, on the societal needs and as well as technological developments. But then in the, in the same context that you're sort of discussing um, some really advanced and, and, and beautiful ideas from, from theoretical mathematics, you sort of do go back <laughs> to, to some things that pretty much everyone learns in, in college. And um, because you, you go back to calculus, which, um, you know, rarely, if ever, elicits excitement <laughs> as an initial reaction, right, in, in any, any setting. So um, kind of back to technology, sort of like that, it seems that you know, technology kind of leads towards, um, you know, visually connected future. So there is like a uh, potential for communicating and teaching mathematics in novel ideas. And um, you are the one who spearheaded development of online, widely available, accessible materials for the, well, it started as a whole calculus sequence. I guess the funny little calculus textbook <laughs> and, and the MOOC that, um, that, you know, it's, it's, like, it's now an ancient history almost. Um, but, um, but you're working sort of on, on developing materials for, for advanced courses too. Okay, so I guess maybe your choices, do the choices of, of courses that you sort of develop um, sort of depend on the need or um, do they follow sort of your research trajectory? How do you, how do you choose which ones to do sort of past calculus? Okay, so let me start off by saying that I'm very excited by calculus. Calculus is super exciting. I love teaching calculus classes. I, I love teaching first year students calculus. This is, this is my favorite thing to teach. Because it's so exciting, there's so many deep ideas in there. Of course, they've been buried under layers and layers of ancient out-of-date textbooks. But the, the kernel of it all, it goes so deep. I will say as an aside, that there's actually quite a bit of interesting topological 
gems hiding within a typical calculus curriculum. I'm not saying that the materials that I've developed are secretly meant to brainwash students into becoming topologists, but I suppose one could do that if one was clever enough. I love teaching calculus. I, I hope I go to my grave teaching lots and lots and lots of calculus. You ask if my research influences what I teach, it's almost the other way around. I find that spending so much time in the, in the core ideas of the calculus it really influences how I think about my research. In particular, all of the work that Yuli Bershnikov and I initiated with respect to applications of Euler calculus it, it wasn't that that work fed into my calculus teaching. It was very much the other way around. So as, uh, as, as grunt worky as it can be, I recommend to all young mathematicians to spend some time teaching calculus, especially multivariable calculus. You'll, you'll fall in love with it all over again. Taking those calculus courses is what turned me on to mathematics. It, it's not an exaggeration to say that my calculus teacher is the reason why I'm a mathematician today. The teaching component of our job, of what we do, I think deserves much more attention and weight than it currently has among researchers. I, I think that this is this is a, a very important, the uh, most important aspect of my calling to this profession is the teaching that I do, the ability to take care of students, inspire them. That, that means a huge amount to me. Those of you who've seen me give talks before, you, you see some of that in the way that I, I try to talk about uh, research, uh, new work, expository work, whatever. All of that is a byproduct of the time that I spend working with students, mostly calculus students. You mentioned the creation of online materials, online courses, things like that. That has certainly been uh, an obsession of mine for the past decade. And I hope to remain obsessed with that, with the creation of really good visual content, really good animated video-based content. There's so much that, that can be done there. I focused on calculus because that has the potential to impact positively so many people. But of course, of course, uh, we should be developing, we, the community, should be developing really high quality, engaging video course materials for for abstract algebra, for algebraic topology, for geometry, for complex analysis, for probability, for all sorts of higher level mathematics courses. Things where the concepts are just super difficult to understand when you're learning it for the first time. There's so much that good visualization can do for you. And there's so many tools available for mathematicians to be able to bring their private visions to life. I feel that where we are at now in terms of availability and uh, extent of software for being able to do high quality video, I feel very much the way I felt, uh, I don't know, 22, 23, 24 years ago when I first started seeing PowerPoint used in talks and, and seeing the, the potential for that to just improve the quality of talks by means of visual content. I think we're at a very similar breakover point where 10 years from now, a lot of people in this business are gonna be spending a lot of time making videos to explain their research. I guess that in a visually inundated world, like seeing captivating and aesthetically 
pleasing dig digital objects of, of mathematics can sort of inspire and, and ignite the sort of visual imagination and, and a different type of learning in, um, in, um, in many, right? But also one of the things that I've, um, I've uh, experienced firsthand from your um, um, early versions of your calculus course is, is that you did put um, Taylor series and Taylor expansions kind of front um, and, and center like in, in your courses, which is not the, the usual textbook thing that I've sort of experienced. And then um, only later, I've actually learned that um, kind of the most well-known contributions uh, sort of to early calculus from like, I don't know, Cavalieri and Fermat and Newton and Leibniz and all other things were, it was actually the, I think, second order Taylor series that sort of existed in, in South Indian region of um, Kerala, like up to 200 years prior to, to that one. And then um, there was, um, um, it was also independently developed in, in, in Japan in the 17th century. Um, so one of the, one of the message that, so, so to, to me that sort of says that even, even sort of when we look at the, the history, that even the history of calculus is, is sort of quite fascinating, but then it also sort of, you can pair that with, with modern applications and there's, there's, you know, an apparent uh, need to, to sort of fall in love with it. Um, but it sort of also says that um, uh, maybe math like art is contemporary and um, dependent or mediated by cultural and historical influences. And, um, and that sort of maybe brings us to some unifying perspectives on, of mathematics and, and art. Um, so I, I like to say that sort of for, for people who do mathematics, there's, there's a lot of art um, aspects of it. So um, what's your take on it? And in particular, maybe what's your take on, on sort of, um, you, you did teach, um, you did point out mathematical aspects of, of again, uh, the divine comedy and, um, and, and a lot of math in, in arts and, and, and literature. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Okay, I'm, I'm having a little trouble identifying the the question here so, so let me... perspectives on math and art sorry to okay me. okay i can work with that art is well is something that i certainly enjoy something that i aspire to it's a lot more hmm, i feel a lot more comfortable talking about my mathematics than i do talking about art just because it's a very uh, private thing, it has much more emotion built into it to the extent that one can divorce the personal and just look at mathematical art as a thing that uh, a lot of us do in the, in the course of our work. I think there's a lot of potential for growth in that area. I, I think mathematics would benefit greatly from having more art in it. You mentioned at the beginning of your question, some of my more radical ideas about how to teach calculus, for example, I have a lot of strong opinions of a rather radical nature about all kinds of things, about, <laughs> about the proper way to teach calculus, single variable, multivariable, et cetera. One of, the, one of the opinions that I hold very strongly that will get me in trouble with a lot of people, and that's okay, I don't mind it, I'm just gonna tell you what I think. I think that LaTeX has been a disaster for mathematics. I will concede that it saved mathematics when it first came out. When tech first came out, it saved mathematics publishing from the very sorry state that it was in. But tech, LaTeX, all of it actively discourages the use of figures, 
Now, before you tell me about your amazing Teeks setup and how you got this really fantastic commutative diagram, which I will take my hat off to you, it's really difficult to do that and to get it to, to look good. But for real figures, figures that are using real 3D rendering software, no, no, this does not play nicely with tech, with LaTeX, it doesn't matter what package you use. It does not play well. I think that in combination with the archive, again, actively discouraging people from putting too many figures in their work, the figure sizes are, are too large. So it gets kicked off uh, the archive system. That's happened to me so many times to the point where I just gave up. I think that that has been actively bad for mathematics research for mathematics education. We need more art. We need more ways to include high quality, big artwork in the papers we publish and the preprints we post, all of that. So I look forward to the impending uh, questions from the audience session in which you can regale me over my love of Microsoft Word. And with that, I think I'm going to stop. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I, I must say that the personal opinion is that your your um, uh, courses that you have developed and and books um, are are um, can be considered as mathematical art, and and in that way, sort of do communicate mathematics in a different way that's um, hopefully more exciting and more approachable, and that's really important. So maybe I'll open the floor for the questions from the audience. And I would like to maybe end with just a question of, um, uh, you've been very generous with, with sharing your ideas and your views of math and the field, but maybe you can also tell us what is the shape of things to come? That, oh boy, if I knew the future, yeah. <laughs> Not very good at predicting the future. Shape of things to come in mathematics, Yes. If you were a venture capitalist, invest in homotopy type theory, invest in automated theorem proving, invest in lattices, and invest in machine learning. That's it. Thank you. Maybe Elkanan is with us. Okay, yes. Okay, I'm going to jump in now. With, there, there are a lot of questions, and they're quite a variety of questions. So it'll, you know, in no particular order. Um, the first question is, how do you think career progression has changed now versus uh, in your time? I guess, well, when you were starting off, let's say. Short answer, for the worse. Everything is so much more difficult now than it used to be. I don't know if it's because I met a, a very uh, selective institution right now where the, the threshold for, for getting into the PhD program or getting a, a postdoc or a tenure track job. It's just an enormously high threshold. Very difficult to get a position in mathematics where I am currently as compared to in the past. It was never easy, but I just see more and more really good top quality people not finding enough positions. It's a very depressing reality. I'm sorry, that's, that's kind of a downer, but that's the way I see things. Okay, well, honesty is best. Um, the next question, um, so we often hear people say that math is language or perhaps math is a language. So as a mathematician, as somebody who has a love for language, what do you make of that statement? Is it true? Is it adjacent to the truth? This is the cause of arguments, war. I'm going to invoke the famous quote of Flannery O'Connor, twist it up a bit, and say, if mathematics is just a language, then to hell with it. I want mathematics that actually captures truth, beauty, is useful, just a language. I have, I have no need for that. Okay, 
Uh, next question. So um, what is a piece of advice or two you would give to somebody preparing for a job interview today? Oh, excellent question. Practice, practice, practice your talk and get some friends who are going to be adversarial, who are, are literally going to interrupt you and ask you rude but sensible questions. Because if you've never had that experience and you, you get that, I hope you don't. People are hopefully nicer now than they were when I was first starting out. But if, if your first experience with someone interrupting you and saying, no, that can't possibly be true. Uh, if your first experience is doing that live at a job interview, then uh, your chances of acing that are mm -mm. so practice, not just uh, going through your talk, getting the timing right, but practice dealing with a somewhat adversarial environment. Always hold back some fairly obvious point so that you know what the first question is going to be and you can answer it directly. That's a thing that legitimately will, will help you, give you a lot of confidence and will set you on the right foot when it comes time for questions. Oh, that's really helpful. Um, the next question, what's your process both creatively and method, methodologically in developing useful pure math analogies for real world systems? That's a very hard question to answer. I, 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 thought, I thought the question was gonna resolve itself into coming up with new ideas, in which case I was gonna say, drink a lot of Monster. I'm still trying to get corporate sponsorship from them. Hasn't worked so far, but it didn't, it didn't go that way. You asked something that I don't know the answer to. I, I will say that many times the, the key breakthrough that I needed to, to find some new application of some interesting mathematics to an applied problem or finding the, the right connection, that it, it came in conversations with people, but often with people who are math adjacent as opposed to people in a math department. So don't be afraid to talk to people who don't work in the same area as you. That's my advice. And you'll be surprised how it gets the creative juices flowing. Okay, thanks. So the next question, this one is a little bit cheeky, so you can feel free to pass. Do you think academics are overrated? Speaking for myself, I would say the answer is yes. Um, overall, that's, that's a tough one. Gun to my head, pick yes or no, I say yes. I say yes. Everyone should spend some time hanging out with people who are not academics. It'll do you a world of good. That's a short answer. Okay, that's a good, that's a helpful answer. The next question is, and this, this uh, uh, harkens back to the beginning of the conversation, what is drafting that you mentioned that you learned uh, in the beginning as an engineer? Yeah, sorry to use a technical term that, uh, that no longer exists because we have computer-aided design. By drafting, I mean mechanical drawing old school stuff with a big architect's table and a T-square and a light box, um, drawing things like uh, blueprints, stuff like that, but for mechanical objects, designing parts, uh, mechanical design, things like that. The illustration of those items is was a, a really big, uh, interesting technical area in the overlap between art and engineering. Of course, now everything is done with computer-aided design, which I think is not a bad skill for mathematicians to pick up because so much of our communication could be more visual than it is. Okay, this is, uh, we're currently halfway through the questions. The next question is, you mentioned having many experiences where 
some type of math that didn't seem so useful or interesting earlier on, later on did become really useful. Do you have any counter examples or examples where things seemed useful and maybe it became a dead end as a piece of advice for those of us early in our careers trying to navigate that? Yeah, so at the risk of upsetting people who, who work in these areas, I, I will say that I, I started off thinking that knot theory was really going to be useful in lots of areas of applied math, and I, I don't think that's really panned out. I remember when I first learned Gromov's age principle, I, I was telling everybody who would listen to me that this is really going to revolutionize a lot of areas of applied mathematics, and it did not happen. Although, although I've been hearing that just in the past couple of years, there's a lot of excitement about convex integration techniques, and these age principle ideas are, are really coming to the fore. You, you can't give up too quickly. Years and years ago, I gave up on applications of contact structures to fluid dynamics because I, I, I tried, I published papers, but I, I just couldn't get anybody to, to really uh, pay any attention to it. It really didn't go anywhere. But whew, within the past several years, there's been a group of really fantastic mathematicians in Spain uh, Eva Miranda, others who have been just killing the area and doing some really fantastic results that are finally getting the attention that they deserve. So yeah, I, I had a list of things that I thought didn't really go anywhere, but you wait around a couple of years and that can change. Okay, so this next question is quite different. So the question starts with an assertion. Rob is an amazing cook, and then refers to some amazing homemade spätzle. And then the question is, have you been, during the, during the pandemic, honing your cooking skills? What do you like to make these days? And do you have any favorite recipes? Thank you to the unknown individual who asked that question. I really appreciate it. Yes, during the pandemic, I have done a lot more baking than I used to do because baking is a kind of thing where you have to, you have to babysit the dough. You, you really gotta, you know, I can't make the bread dough in the morning, go to work all day and then come home and, and make bread. The, the timing, it's not right. So did a lot of baking and I've gotten really, really good at pizza crusts. I mean, I figured out a couple of secrets that are just oh, fantastic. So yeah, pizza crust. Mm. Okay, that's uh, yeah, well, something to look into. Um, so the next question is, uh, as a comparison between, I guess in mathematics, some people are tool makers and there are artists who use those tools. What percentage of your career do you think you were the tool maker versus the artist? Yeah, so I would, I would say I definitely lean much more towards the latter, towards a user as opposed to a tool maker, although I've done some tooling, but it's at, it's at least a, a one to two, one to three ratio as I think is the case with most applied mathematicians. Um, being such a de devoted teacher, researcher, uh, research leader, advisor, how do you balance your time? Do you even, how do you even find enough time for everything that you do, all the different hats that you wear? No sleep. I sleep about uh, five or six hours a night. So is this another plug for Monster Energy Drink? Even without the monster, don't need an alarm clock. There's, there's always just too much to do. Okay, so uh, next question. So uh, you're a fan of, you're a big fan of the Divine Comedy. Do you draw inspiration from, from the classics when you do math, either in, in the math itself or in the writing? Yes and yes. I am known in certain circles as a troll 
who very meticulously and uh, intentionally inserts literary references into anything artistic that I do, be it uh, visual, be it in how I how I write the 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 book on applied topology that I wrote back in what was it 20, 2014, something like that. Elementary applied topology is just full of Joycean references and cross references. The integration of illusion into anything creative that I do is a habit, perhaps a bad habit, but a habit inherited from very good people, from Joyce, from Elliot. Yes, it's a good way to go. Um, the next question is, sometimes uh, math becomes disconnected from question asks reality or visualization in the name of rigor and it can produce um, mathematics or mathematicians that have a hard time communicating with others what do you think about the notion of rigor and uh, its place in this dynamic oh that question is a uh, is a field of war right going back to the idea of intuition versus uh, rigor I think that for me, it's it's almost impossible to do mathematics without suspending all thought of rigor and just plowing through intuition, grasping at, at some truth that seems to be out there and only later going back and justifying it, if it's indeed justifiable. That is very much how I work. That is very much how many of the best mathematicians that I know uh, work. That is not how everybody works. You, you choose your own path, that's fine. But I, I very much uh, find myself when doing research, looking for what ought to be true rather than what is incrementally step-by-step -step verifiably true. The penultimate question, why should mathematical venture capitalists invest in lattices? Ah, lattices, by which I mean uh, algebraic lattices, partial ordered sets, join, meet, this kind of thing. That, that is a, a huge area of mathematics that is very insular and very cut off from the the normal workaday tools that most mathematicians use. I was, um, well, I'm not an expert at lattice theory by any stretch, but over the years I've seen works by Grandis, by others, some in a theoretical computer science context that, that really convinced me that lattices and categories of lattices and lattice morphisms are really, really rich structures. They are an excellent type of data category that one could value a system or a sheaf in. I think the reason why a venture capitalist might want to invest in lattices is due to potential applications in things like machine learning. You look at neural nets, convolutional neural nets, anything like that. Everything is always valued in Euclidean vector spaces to the point where you often have to do violence to the data to vectorize it, to get it into the form where you pop it into the standard neural network constructs. Neural networks that are valued in more general data categories than Euclidean spaces and linear transformations could be enormously useful, but there are very, very serious, difficult mathematical issues in working with machine learning that is valued in categories like 
lattices, like things that are more complicated than vectors. And the final question, and then I'll hand it back to Sarah. Uh, what's the um, what's the image in the background? Are you pining for the metro or in, behind you? That is uh, that is a still shot from an upcoming video course that I am working on with Vidit Nanda. This is a foundations of topological data analysis. There is a little trailer for that that dropped on my YouTube page a couple of weeks ago in which a subway car plays a prominent role. Why a subway car? This is something that I will not answer in public at this time. Okay, uh, so thanks again, everyone, for joining. And thanks to Radmila and Rob for the wonderful interview. Uh, so with this, I'm going to stop the recording.